and that's um, simply the the title of it. Um, and I, I I believe that uh, I will be able to uh, skip over the very first part of this because uh, I, the uh, distinctions that I was going to draw were were just um, carefully uh, laid out uh, by Dr. Benjamini. And I do want to thank uh, my uh, various collaborators for the little bit of data that I will show you um, today. But I must say that I, um, uh, I really uh, don't have uh, much recent data that is germane to this topic. Most of the, my work in this area has, was done some time ago. So I'd be, I've chosen in this talk rather than to try to um, express my opinions about this topic and uh, to to try to do that in a way that um, I hope to generate a, a good bit of disagreement uh, with those opinions and stimulate uh, discussion on some of the issues. Uh, so I thought I would start by um, offering you the very quick, my very quick answer to uh, at least the questions that you posed to us at the outset of this meeting, the ones that I know anything about. Why has this problem surfaced in um, recent uh, years, and I think it hasn't really. The problem's always been here, as was pointed out to you. And for some reason, people have started to pay attention to it, mostly people who don't really know a lot about it. Um, that attention has uh, managed to snowball, and now the NIH in particular, Francis Collins and everybody else are very much upset with it. But it's really been around for a long time. Um, is the situation becoming worse? I don't believe that it is. Um, and I don't know that there are a lot of data out there that would prove one way or the other. Uh, but my opinion is it's no different. Um, are behavioral phenotyping measures less replicable ones, as you'd say, the pharmaceutical industry claims, nature and science claims? Um, Finally, is strict standardization a uh, remedy for this kind of lack of replication? And uh, probably not surprisingly, no, I don't believe that it is, in fact, a solution to, this, uh, to the issues of reproducibility and, and the like. I will show you point here, which is the claim that uh, behavioral phenotypes are intrinsically more variable than uh, other kinds of biological phenotypes. This is taken from a, uh, a retrospective analysis that uh, Doug Walston performed of data going back to, um, is, there, is there a pointer here? Probably not, but going back to uh, as old as the uh, 1950s and 19, uh, and 1960s um, that compared in the top, um, well, what's shown across the bottom here are data on standard inbred strains of mice. Each dot on those uh, regression curves is a standard strain's mean value on a variable. Uh, comparing data that he collected in his own laboratory in Edmonton with data from four other laboratories. One of his at a different site, our laboratory in Portland. Um, there's old data, there's data uh, from Rock Williams in 2000. Um, but the top row there is brain weight data. What could be, ah, okay. thank you, yeah. Um, brain weight is, uh, should be as rock solid across mouse strains from year to year from the relative position of mouse strains as any biological phenotype anyone can think of. And in fact, the correlations of old, old uh, data and much more contemporaneous data are very high. But look at alcohol preference drinking. Those correlations are equally high. There's a behavioral measure uh, that was done in quite different ways in laboratories in the 1990s and more recently and going back to the 1960s and locomotor activity data. Unstimulated activity, exploratory activity in an open field in mice 
is also very highly replicable. So I don't think that behavioral data are necessarily any more variable than, quote, biological uh, data. But it depends on what measure you look at. Also taken from this retrospective analysis is a comparison of the about the largest uh, collection of inbred strains at the time from Phil Skolnick and uh, Ramon Sklas, uh compared against uh, data in Doug Walston's lab on an animal model, of, a mouse model of anxiety-like behavior, the uh, amount of time that they spend exploring the open arms of an elevated plus maze. There's a very poor correlation across strains uh, with historical data and current data, but um, with a much larger number of strains compared to Doug's data with our data uh, in Portland using the same strains, there's a much better uh, correlation because we used conditions that were much, much more similar. So it really depends on how you handle the environment. I'm going to skip this because we uh, repeatability versus reproducibility, I think, is just very nicely defined. Um, and get to the issue of what we're trying to understand here is relating uh, genetic data, many of us in this room, and behavioral data in mice that may be, uh, that are genetically highly diverse across all of the subjects. We all know that that's a process that ultimately it tries to relate specific genes uh, to specific behaviors. But what we really know is that the gene, the genetic and environmental interactions are inescapable. They are part of whatever we measure. Uh, and so really what our, our problem here is, is understanding the uh, environmental controls that are necessary to make good inferences, I think. <clears throat> We've described those environments in different ways. I think you can, you need to start organismically. I mean, we all start as a zygote. All of us mammals start as a zygote, and you can't ignore everything that is post-zygotic between that and the adult mouse, although we generally do. And then there's everything about your animal facility, your university, your location in the world, your latitude, your longitude, your air, your water, your lighting, and all of that. Um, and then finally, there's the laboratory and testing environment in which you do the experiments to uh, measure the behavior that you're trying to uh, trace back to genetics. That also is subject to all of these environmental variables, plus others, because frequently you move the animals right before you test them. Um, and, and we need to consider all of those kinds of things. And finally, is strict standardization uh, the remedy for this kind of lack of replication? And uh, probably not surprisingly, no, I don't believe that it is, in fact, a solution to this uh, to the issues of reproducibility and the like. I will show you point here, which is the claim that uh, behavioral phenotypes are intrinsically more variable than uh, other kinds of biological phenotypes. This is taken from a, uh, a retrospective analysis that uh, Doug Walston performed of data going back to, um, is, there, is there a pointer here? Probably not, but going back to uh, as old as the uh, 1950s and 19, uh, and 1960s um, that compared in the top, um, well, what's shown across the bottom here are data on standard inbred strains of mice. Each dot on those uh, regression curves is a standard strain's mean value on a variable. Uh, comparing data that he collected in his own laboratory in Edmonton with data from four other laboratories. One of his at a different site, our laboratory in Portland. Um, there's old data, there's data uh, from Rock Williams in 2000. Um, 
but the top row there is brainwave data. What could be? Ah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, brainwave is uh, should be as rock solid across mouse strains from year to year, from the, the relative position of mouse strains, as any biological phenotype anyone can think of, and in fact, the correlations of old, old uh, data and much more contemporaneous data are very high. But look at alcohol preference drinking. Those correlations are equally high. There's a behavioral measure uh, that was done in quite different ways in laboratories in the 1990s and more recently and going back to the 1960s. And locomotor activity data, unstimulated activity, exploratory activity in an open field in mice is also very highly replicable. So I don't think that behavioral data are necessarily any more variable than, quote, biological uh, data. But it depends on what measure you look at. Also taken from this retrospective analysis is a comparison of the about the largest uh, collection of inbred strains at the time from Phil Skolnick and uh, Ramos Rolas uh, compared against uh, data in Doug Walston's lab on an animal model, of a mouse model of anxiety-like behavior, the uh, amount of time that they spend exploring the open arms of an elevated plus maze. There's a very poor correlation across strains uh, with historical data and current data, but um, with a much larger number of strains compared to Doug's data with our data uh, in Portland using the same strains, there's a much better uh, correlation because we used conditions that were much, much more similar. So it really depends on how you handle the environment. I'm going to skip this because we uh, repeatability versus reproducibility, I think, is just very nicely defined. Um, and get to the issue of what we're trying to understand here is relating uh, genetic data, many of us in this room, and behavioral data in mice that may be, uh, that are genetically highly diverse across all of the subjects. We all know that that's a process that ultimately tries to relate specific genes um, to specific behaviors. But what we really know is that the gene, the genetic and environmental interactions are inescapable. They are part of whatever we measure. Uh, and so really what our, our problem here is, is understanding the uh, environmental controls that are necessary to make good inferences, I think. <clears throat> We've described those environments in different ways. I think you can, you need to start organismically. I mean, we all start as a zygote. All of us mammals start as a zygote, and you can't ignore everything that is post-zygotic between that and the adult mouse, although we generally do. And then there's everything about your animal facility, your university, your location in the world, your latitude, your longitude, your air, your water, your lighting, and all of that. Um, and then finally, there's the laboratory and testing environment in which you do the experiments to uh, measure the behavior that you're trying to uh, trace back to genetics. That also is subject to all of these environmental variables, plus others, because frequently you move the animals right before you test them, um, and, and we need to consider all of those kinds of things. He asked uh, whether or not uh, we would be able to generalize this result to other standard measures of mouse ataxia. What's the most obvious one? This is the uh, this is the, the accelerating rotor rod where the rod rotates faster until the animal falls. Um, and he tested, which we started therefore knowing that these animals already differed on two tests of ataxia. 
And when he tested them on the rotor rod, what he found was that there was absolutely no difference in sensitivity to alcohol. He used a different variant of the rotor rod test. Same result, absolutely no different. He used a test called the screen test, another simple assay of a mouse's ability to move around in a coordinated fashion. No difference at all. He looked at their ability to balance on a static dowel. You would think this is just like the balance beam, traversing a balance beam without making errors. No difference in sensitivity whatsoever. He measured their muscle strength on a, with a force dynamometer, pulling their muscle strength away. Alcohol impairs muscle strength. No difference whatsoever. He looked at their sensitivity to an anesthetic dose of alcohol. Absolutely no difference. So really, the, uh, this, the point I'm trying to belabor here is that no single behavioral assay in mice can capture a construct as complicated as motor coordination or ataxia. Uh, a third proposition I'll make is that there's no such thing as an ethologically relevant assay for mice that is conducted in a laboratory. Mice don't grow, not even laboratory mice after all these generations are, as, are adapted enough to, uh, to laboratory conditions for this, anything we do with them really to be uh, more ethologically relevant. And that's something I could certainly get some argument with. The fourth proposition, I think animals don't know the difference between automated assessment and being handled by a, 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 a person. Uh, I, I think they respond to the person or thing that is moving them around or collecting data. And there really aren't any data that show the superiority of automated data collection. Direct and universal standardization of laboratory and test environments is infeasible. I don't think this is ever going to happen. I think this would be a loss to the field if we tried to remove and, and, and focus uh, drastically on a few protocols and a few apparatus and a few times a day. And uh, for the reasons that uh, we really don't know how any uh, restricted range of conditions will generalize. And I will point to the 1999 uh, study that was mentioned in the uh, introduction where we compared uh, laboratory strain, inbred laboratory strains of mice where we controlled almost every environmental variable we could easily control. We still found very strong, these are, these are not um, p-values, these are effect sizes, actually. These are partial omega squares. Uh, but we found very strong uh, uh, strain differences consistently across lots of behaviors. We found laboratory site differences, like were mentioned for the plants. Uh, and we still found fairly substantial genotype by environment interactions for some behaviors, but not all behaviors. I think this is the last proposition I'll offer you. Um, these genotype by environment interactions um, are maybe unreliable. Maybe this is an example of unreliability. On the other hand, it may be that these particular behaviors that show genotype environment interaction are the behaviors and the conditions that are sensitive to environmental conditions. And so they may, may represent a real opportunity rather than a limitation to these kinds of, uh, of data. So I think in conclusion, we all agree that we're after valid behavior genetic relationships. But sometimes uh, the number of animals that we would need to really achieve uh, convergent validity or any of the other many types of validity really forces us to use fewer assays, simpler behavioral assays than we would like to. Reproducibility is clearly crucial for science. Nothing uh, progresses uh, without reproducibility, but we can't expect it 
unless we truly understand and control the relevant parts of the environment. So figuring out what those parts are is the key, I think. It's generalizability. That is our real goal. Uh, generalizability is the part that people don't get around to. It's the part that you really uh, want to find, but we know that these mirroring tests and these procedures where we collect these data sometimes just don't uh, generalize, um, as in the example that I showed you. And that's all that I have. I'd be happy to uh, answer questions. Mm.